it's, it's, it's really hard because we're just scratching the surface, and I know that, and so you're trying to give due, uh, justice to all of these artists and, and what they have to say, um, and I hope you'll, you'll, you'll beg, uh, I beg your forgiveness in, in how we get this through this. So next group we have, um, we have the artistic director of Martha Graham Dance Company, Janet Alber. We have the Dean of Dance at the UNC School of the Arts and former prima ballerina at ABT, Susan Jaffe. And we have chancellor and maestro of the UNC School of the Arts, John Mauchery. Please join us. Um, well, obviously, with what we just heard from those other three distinguished guests, we have now a new set of three distinguished guests. Um, perhaps it can be a good way to, to jump off. Uh, maybe I can start with Janet and say, um, Janet, we got into this conversation somewhat late, but um, I really loved how uh, we, Carolina Performing Arts and the Graham Company, got together because I think it really does uh, uh, symbolize the, the passion that we both share with, of course, Graham, Le Graham legacy, but also in terms of advancing the art. Could you talk a little bit about that and the program and how you think it might relate to what we're talking about today? I wish I could make that face that Yo-Yo made. Am I on? <laughs> yeah. um, uh, well, Graham is bringing a program called Myth and Transformation uh, because we, we're doing a, a thematic season in which we, we talk about and dance about how artists appropriate themes, legends, myths, and um, uh, transform them to make contemporary statements. Right. Uh, certainly throughout Graham's life and, and any artist, we can find examples and uh, build programs around them. So as well as bringing Graham's Rite of Spring, we'll be bringing Graham's Appalachian Spring, which she called a legend of American living uh, and is a very iconic American statement. And uh, we're delighted to have a premiere by Nacho Duarto, uh, which I can't tell you anything about, uh, not because it's embargoed, but because he hasn't started it yet. <laughs> uh, we, haven't, we haven't had him in the rehearsal studio yet. He has chosen music by Avo Pert, uh, which we're excited about, and will be performed live yes. by the UNC choir. Our student choir will be singing alongside the Graham Company. Mm -hmm. so. um, the right of Martha's Rite of Spring, I think, is sort of destined to happen. She performed as the chosen one in the first American production in 1930, when she was about 35 years old, and I think sort of avoided it for her long career where she used almost exclusively commissioned music. But in 1984, when she was 90, uh, she returned to the Rite of Spring and created her own version. Um, I, I think it's a natural fit to the Stravinsky music because Graham's radical physical vocabulary that she was discovering uh, the late 1920s and early 30s, about the time that she danced the Rite of Spring, is, is so primal, it's so descriptive of human emotion, it's, it's a theatricalization of, of natural uh, gesture, of body language. Um, and as Stravinsky was going for this sort of primal sound, Graham was developing a primal movement vocabulary to go with it. Oh, wow, that's great. Uh, if I could just go on, maybe we can come back to, to Janet here. S uh, Susan, you just recently arrived as the Dean of Dance at the School of the Arts. How did, first of all, John convince you to come down to our fair state? I have to ask you that. You, you can't say no to John. <laughs> <laughs> Should I leave the stage? <laughs> <laughs> no, this just tremendous energy coming from him, creativity, his passion for the school, his passion for the kids, I was just completely lured in. I just said, I've got to be there. That's wonderful. So that's why I'm here. And so with your collective project, and I'll speak, I guess, to both of you, John, you and I have talked about this for a long time now, and um, your brain is, it's like for me, uh, uh, it's a laboratory that I can't really get my arms around. Uh, it's uh, moving a million miles a minute, as we all know, and it's constantly evolving. Um, Maybe you can share with us a bit of the vision behind the program for the School of the Arts and how you think, um, what you think you're trying to achieve with your evening that you'll bring to Chapel Hill. Well, uh, first of all, I suppose part of our conversation was having a whole program for a school uh, was 
a tremendous honor and we're very grateful to you. We also n understood that since the Joffrey was going to come and bring their restoration uh, of the original Nijinsky, and I saw you know, the Cleveland Orchestra, Mariinsky, and a, a lot of our professional colleagues, I, th I, I didn't want to compete, but we wanted to complete uh, a picture. And uh, the program, so you might know, because it hasn't actually been published, it's changed a bit. We begin with a rite of spring that Shen Wei, a contemporary choreographer, has done, uh, which our students will dance. Significantly, this is a version of the rite of spring uh, that you otherwise will not hear. It's the version for two pianos. Uh, this is particularly interesting because you hear it in a very different way since the timbre is always one color. So you're actually hearing the notes and the rhythms in a very different way. Significantly, the first performance of this two piano version was played by Claude Debussy and Stravinsky who showed up one day at the door uh, with the score under his arm and, uh, and uh, asked uh, Claude if he would play it. Uh, and uh, then Stravinsky asked permission to take off his collar uh, because he knew he was going to get pretty sweaty. Apparently, uh, Debussy took the lower part and sight read it. Uh, that was a performance that we all would like to have been at. Uh, <laughs> I think significantly, uh, and this is where the program now moves uh, forward, uh, Debussy was horrified by the movement that music was going into. Stravinsky was on record as being in favor of the coming war. Remember, there were wars going on during this. The official opening of World War I doesn't come until 1914. But by 1912, 1913, there's a lot going on. And in fact, within two weeks of the opening of the, of, of the Rite of Spring, uh, all-out war is breaking out uh, in the Balkans. And so uh, Stravinsky was in favor of war. And I, and I think the modernists obviously thought that war was something that would cleanse society. Stravinsky was on record as saying that the weak would be destroyed and the, and the world would be a stronger place. So Debussy's response is very different. And two weeks before the opening of the Rite of Spring, Debussy's last fully orchestrated ballet called Je premieres at the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées, choreographed and danced by Nijinsky. Remember, Nijinsky did not dance in the Rite of Spring, he choreographed it, but he did choreograph and dance Je, which is a 17-minute ballet. So, what, so after we play the original two-piano version of the rite, newly choreographed or recently choreographed, we'll do Afternoon of the Fawn. Now, Afternoon of the Fawn was the first piece that Nijinsky choreographed. And this is also a response to what's going on. Here, Nijinsky shows the sensuality that comes out of the 19th century with a kind of perfect Debussy work from the late 19th century based on a response to a poem written at the time of our American Civil War, now in the 1890s. Debussy writes it as a tone poem, and then in 1911, 1912, Nijinsky puts it on the stage. So this from the idea of the poem by Mallarmé to the final uh, visualization by Nijinsky is an important one. Then we will, then we will perform Je. And our students are learning Je, it's for three people. It's the first ballet in history that takes place in its own time. So it takes place in 1913. It takes place in a tennis court. And it's for two women and a man. The man, Nijinsky, they're all three people presumably going to play tennis. But what's significant, again, because this is about movement, is that the movement here uh, is, is actually one of light as well as physical movement because when Nijinsky went to London, he saw for the first time electric lights in a park. And he said, this is what I want for Je. So the point of Je, among many, is that the, the ballet begins at sunset, which is a natural light. And then the electric lights come on, which is an unnatural light, which opens the door to what would be considered unnatural acts. Two women have come to this place in the park to, quote, share confidences. A man, about, a man, that was Nijinsky, is a, is a tennis player, he enters also. The three of them have different duets of jealousy and, and it climaxes with a triple kiss, which was the shock of this particular ballet. It was not the shock of the music being percussive the way the Rite of Spring was, or violent. It was the shock of a menage a trois with two women who clearly one of whom loves the other and the idea of the interruption of the man. At the very end of this ballet, by the way, when the three of them have kissed and lie down on the grass, 
a tennis ball bounces on the stage, they realize they're being watched, and they all escape into the night. Now that is the story of Je. After we do Je, we will do a brand new creation, which Susan is going to choreograph to the Palabetsian dances from Prince Igor of Borodin. Why the Palabetsian dances? That's because in the first season that Diaghilev had in Paris, he did a, a choreography, a production of the, the Palabetsian dances designed significantly enough by Nicholas Rurich, who would write the story of the Rite of Spring and design the Rite of Spring. And this very pagan choreography and presentation of the Palabetsian dances had men who were naked from the waist up with their bodies covered in mud. And this was a sensation because it was so primitive and so erotic and so athletic that even though it was the second third of this program, the audience rushed the stage door and were astonished. And so, in a way, it was Palavetsian that led to the Rite of Spring. And I do believe that Diaghilev, talk about entrepreneurship, which was what Yo-Yo was talking about, was that Diaghilev was smart enough to know that this desire for violence and sensuality was something that was going to sell tickets, which is why it ultimately, two years later, turns into the same designer, with a, but a brand new score, and the most uh, controversial choreographer of the time. And so that's really the program. <laughs> that's good... um, so, so Susan, with that as an introduction, have you started to think about the work and how you might make it? I, I have started to think about it. Um, in keeping with the whole idea of the Rite of Spring and the newness of the music and how it really changed uh, the paradigm. I've decided, as in when talking with John, that, that this would be not any, anywhere near what it was when it was done in the opera, when it was done with um, the Ballet Russe, but that it would be a completely new vision of posing dances. Um, decided to go against the lyricism of the uh, beginning of the music and bring in sharp, jagged edges, um, more primitive um, movement, very a more aggressive movement, um, and extremely contemporary on point. And so in keeping with all of the, 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 the art that has uh, in music and everything that has stemmed from this performance of the Rite of Spring, I would like to go forward with my own creativity in creating um, a new work that really has nothing to do with the original. Wow. Uh, and since you're new there, what's been, what's, been the, uh, what's been your take on the young dancers at the school, and how do you, uh, how do you anticipate if at all, altering what you might do if they were professionals versus students? Well, being that I've worked with both, um, I did have my own dance school in Princeton, New Jersey, and I, that's where I started choreographing. Uh, and then I went back to ballet theater uh, where I danced for 22 years and uh, coached the, dan the principal dancers there. And, you know, of course, the, with the Students, you can't, it can't be as advanced, but you can push them pretty hard. And in fact, just this past week, we are doing a new William, William Forsythe auditor that was done on professionals and the, asking the kids to do exactly um, what the professionals would have done. So they really like to be pushed. And um, what's really nice about students is they, they don't know what their limitations are yet. <laughs> so you can just keep telling them how, where they can, they can go, where they can fill in, and they keep believing you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, it's just so uh, exciting. Well, I know we're, so we're, I think we're very lucky that, to have you in our state. And, for me, for me, when John mentioned that you were coming on board as dean, I just couldn't believe it, how lucky we were, because this project had been going already but before that announcement, and it seemed like the most perfect kind of collaboration. And what I'm not sure if everyone knows, but um, actually, Chancellor Mao Cherry will also be conducting part of the evening in the pit. 
uh, with, the, with the School of the Arts Orchestra. And it was one of the conditions, conditions I set to him <laughs> because I think it's really important that we actually see our higher education leaders and the incredible craft that they bring to the job. And um, John, how have you managed, and I guess maybe after that we'll go back to Janet, but how have you managed this, this dual career of yours and, as chancellor and conductor? Well, the idea when I was made chancellor uh, was to continue performing, not only outside and taking kids with me as sort of shadow artists, um, but also in, in the school. So that was the basic idea. And of course, I think that's some of the happiest experiences of our lives working with students, you know, because you can take them so far. And the School of the Arts has just got, you know, some, some of the best musicians in the country. And uh, it is, after all, the conservatory of the state, not to mention the South. So uh, Je is, is, uh, is a very difficult score, even though it's 17 minutes long. Debussy is notoriously difficult. One of the secrets about the Rite of Spring uh, which I did a lot when I was at Yale and, and, and with the Yale Symphony, uh, is actually for all the thing, all the talk about how hard it is, it's actually, you know, Firebird is much harder. The thing about it, if you think about it, those of you who are musicians out there, the string parts in the Rite of Spring are actually really easy. Um, and and the, the, the rhythms are more complicated, but for, but for young people now it's really not. I mean, it should always be a struggle, otherwise it doesn't have any point. And I think Richard had er earlier talked to us about the change of the, of the Rite of Spring since 1913 to now, about how it turns from something that was just so stressful and, and, and difficult and, and passionate but dark and ugly into something that's more like an athletic event, you know, like where everybody <laughs> cheers when it's over. And, uh, and, and I, I'm on record as saying it's a piece I, I never want to conduct again. I remember the last time I conducted it. No, and it's not because it's hard, because I, I remember when I had to take over uh, my, actually my professional debut with the Los Angeles Philharmonic, and I was 27, oh. and uh, there was the Los Angeles Philharmonic with John What's-His-Name replacing Joseph Cripps, you know, and I could see them <laughs> looking at me thinking, oh no. And, and so I said, good morning, and let's go to 116, which is the sacral dance, whatever the number of the sacral dance. So we went to the hardest part of the piece, because I thought, I'm not gonna like try to get to this in 35 minutes. I'm just gonna do this right now. So we're gonna get this over with. So we did it, they all tapped their bows and then we went back to the beginning. But I have to say that, that digging into yourself to actually perform the Rite of Spring, to become this violent thing, you have to become it to really connect it, is something that's so awful that, that uh, and, and I think no one has yet talked and I think it's worth those of you in your classes to talk about Again, entrepreneurship, whether Stravinsky was actually making commercial use of the coming war, because he really knew that this was, this was something in the air that people actually wanted. And it's true that the next year, when it was performed without the ballet, it was a huge hit. And I, and I said in a, in a blog I wrote a few weeks ago that many of the young men who heard that performance and were giving standing ovations to it were part of the 14 million people who died in World War I, because they actually thought this was a good thing. And, and Stravinsky never wrote like that again. For all the talk about its influence, it had no influence, really, until, and this is, and I'm gonna say something shocking, it really, its major influence happened after Disney put it in Fantasia. And that is the fact. After 1940, Stravinsky was living in Los Angeles, and he made a new version of the Sacral Dance, the one part that was cut from Fantasia, and made it a concert performance. And then it became the source of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you know, Psycho, Planet of the Apes, go through the list. And funnily enough, that's when the Rite of Spring really became part of everybody's consciousness. But nobody wanted to write like that because it was World War I. After World War I, people were now taking Pergolese and adding little <laughs> extra notes to it. They were, you know, you know they, were, they were modeling, you know, uh, uh, cantatas after Verdi. It's a, because they really realized that they couldn't write that anymore. Stravinsky writes uh, L'Istra du Soldat, which is a post-World War I piece. So it's really interesting that you could look at the Rite of Spring not as the opening of, of a new world, but the closing of a history of the aestheticization of violence that starts somewhere in the 19th century and actually ends with the Rite of Spring. Wow, very good. Thanks, sir. <laughs> Janet, we'll, we'll come back and end with you. I think a lot of this is really looking back at the, the monumental history that some of these artists and individuals placed. 
I can think of no more monumental individual than Martha Graham. It's, for me, I, I can only imagine the difficulty of your job. Here you have, on one hand, this the queen of, of dance in not just America, but in the world, um, and her immense legacy uh, sort of weighing down on you and uh, trying to, of course, do everything you can to preserve that legacy forever so that it can actually be imparted on thousands and thousands of people going forward. But of course, I'm sure, and again, we haven't talked about this, but I'm sure you're also still trying to make it anew. How do you, again, how do you manage that, that struggle? Do you see it as a struggle or not? Or, um, and you know, thinking about that legacy that I just mentioned. Yeah, it's, it's really the elephant in the room in modern dance. It's not just the Graham legacy, sure. but uh, modern dance uh, is about 100 years old now, uh, American, unique American art form. And um, it, because it's ephemeral, because it exists only in live performance, uh, it doesn't have the, the uh, same documentation that, that other art forms sure. do. Uh, and it's been born out of revolt and driven by revolt for decades, you know, out with the old, in with the new. And there's no um, uh, tradition of valuing the past of the art form. Yeah. So it's not just a struggle for the Martha Graham Dance Company. It's really something the field in general has to look at. Um, how do we move forward? How do we celebrate our past and use it as a springboard to move forward? or be destined to repeat it. Right. Because there are young choreographers and directors working today thinking that they're discovering something that those of us who have lived long enough in the art form know was discovered 50, 60 years ago. Um, so it's, it's what the Graham organization is doing is um, using the Graham legacy as a true springboard right. and um, commissioning a lot of new works. Uh, we have a wonderful project I'm very proud of called the Lamentation Variations, where we've asked young choreographers to be inspired by a film of Martha Graham dancing her iconic solo Lamentation, and to create a, a sketch, a choreographic reaction to Lamentation. Um, and uh, we're up to eight or nine variations at this point. Vilar Lupovich, Ilan Rayner, Doug Verone, we just premiered one by, and, and uh, Richard Move, Azure Barton, Larry Kegwin, we're, we're um, uh, have a sampler of uh, these extraordinary young artists, new artists, um, reacting to Graham's legacy. And we've done several other projects in that mold. We worked with uh, Ann Bogart and City Company a couple right. years ago on a, on a theater work that was uh, launched out of a work that Graham did in the 1930s. Um, so it's, uh, we know that we can give you a fabulous performance of Appalachian Spring. We mm -hmm. know we can do Clytemestra the way she wanted it originally. So we have um, no compunction about opening the door wide and saying, let's take this material and use it in any way possible. Wow, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think we run out of time, but I wanted to thank Janet. I want to thank all of you, Susan and John, for being with us here. Thank you, thank you very much.